welcome back to DIY guitar making. I'm gonna put this thing away and we are doing uh, Q and A's today. So, uh, let me do a little preamble first, I guess, cause I usually do. I just finished the spring workshops. I had a bunch of great guys came out. We had Loring, Chris, Anthony, um, Brian and Ed all came out for the three spring workshops that I had. And now um, I'm just filling up classes for the fall. So if you are interested in getting in on a workshop like that, check out my schedule at ericshaferguitars.com for the fall acoustic guitar build workshop dates. And for this episode for this q a i'm going to be answering uh members forum questions only because there's a good number of them in there and i really want to get to them and i really need to charge my phone so i'm gonna do this with my charger plugged in here and i'm just gonna scroll through these uh, because i have to scroll through the members forum there might be a lot of dead space between questions which i'm just going to edit out i don't know why i'm telling you about that but uh, it's going to be a bit of a, a struggle here to get myself set up. By the way, the members forum is a forum that is associated with the online guitar building school and specifically the building an OM acoustic course. So this is a course that I've designed, an online course that walks you through step by step through the course of 61 different videos, how to build an acoustic guitar from scratch. Okay, everything from rough milling out your materials to applying a true oil finish at the end. And uh, if, if you wanna be a part of this forum that I'm talking about, you have to purchase that course. I do also wanna mention that, um, I know I've mentioned before that I'm switching the forums over to a Discord channel at some point. I'm still working on that, that's coming out and the forum experience is gonna be greatly improved when I have that Discord channel up. So I'm very excited about getting you guys onto a better platform for guitar discussion, okay? The first members forum question that I have here is from David Crawl, and David writes, does anyone know where one could find a set of guitar plans for an OM guitar Preferably that employs Gore, that's Trevor Gore, Gore's falcate bracing pattern. I really want to try this on my next build. And now I'm going to read Terrence Wade's answer to this because it's perfect and then I'll kind of add my own thing to it. So Terrence writes, Hi David, the only place I know to get full size falcate braced plans is to buy the Contemporary Acoustic Guitar Design 2nd Edition book by Trevor Gore and Gerard Gillette. This is made up of two books, one on design and one on build with four sets of full-size guitar plans. At the moment, the books seem hard to get, but try on Trevor Gore's guitar site in Australia. I hope this helps. It's Terry Wade from Boral uh, NSW Australia. Um, New South, NSW, I think stands for New South Wales. I was like, I can do this one. I think, <laughs> I think I know what that is. I'm not from Australia, obviously. Uh, well, thank you for that, uh, Terrence. That's a really great answer and coming from uh, someone in Australia too, which is perfect because um, that's where uh, Trevor Gore is. So a little, a little bit about uh, falcate bracing patterns, just because, just because it's interesting, because you guys m might not know what that is. It's an alternative uh, bracing, uh, alternative conception of a bracing pattern. So it's basically built off the idea that so we, you know, we've used the X brace for years and years and years, and the X brace uh, kind of assumes that hey, the materials that we have to use, which is wood, are straight. Right, and the word falcate means curved or hooked. And so, as we developed new technologies, particularly using carbon fiber, 
Trevor Gore came up with this idea that, hey, maybe we don't need all of our braces. Maybe we don't need to design a pattern that is based off of straight planks of wood. We can, using these newer technologies, actually use curved pieces of wood um, and, and carbon fiber, uh, which dramatically improves the stiffness to weight ratio. So the whole thing is really based off the idea that an, an X brace is overbuilt. Okay, I use an X brace, I think it's fine, um, but also I've never tried this Falcate bracing pattern. I think it's interesting, there might be something to it. You can only do so many things <laughs> with, with the, the time that you have, so I kind of focus on the X brace. But I, I find that the Falcate bracing pattern is very interesting. I'll throw a picture of it uh, somewhere on the screen here, just so you guys can see what I mean by those curved, uh, that curved bracing pattern design. It certainly looks efficient. So, uh, interesting to, to research and uh, worth giving a shot for some of you guys out there. Uh, maybe even one day I'll, I'll give this a shot too because I think it's super cool. And Trevor Gore um, is a luminary in the craft. So, if he, think, if he likes it, then there's something to it. Next question, let's move on from there. All right, let me navigate the forum here to find the next question. I can't wait until this is on the Discord channel, by the way, because th that's really one of the main reasons for doing it is, is a lot of these more modern platforms, um, forums are kind of like a dinosaur <laughs> on, on the uh, internet world. Um, these more modern platforms like Discord and... Uh, well, Discord's really the only one because Discord does f doesn't just do messaging and uh, text and social media type applications. Discord supports forums, which function a little bit differently. Forums allow you to search for topical information, whereas a, a strictly uh, Instagram or Facebook style platform just creates ephemeral messaging that um, creates a feed that constantly pushes the old information down and out. So we want a channel that maintains the posterity of certain questions and threads. All right, here is a uh, just a, a new member introduction. Hello from Northern California. This is Jose Sumacuyao. I'm going to say that's how you pronounce it. Hello all, I'm Joe from Stockton in NorCal. I've been making electric guitars for the past few years, but then got a new uh, a Stumac Dreadnought kit and just recently finished it up. It got me thinking about making more acoustic guitars since I love the process of building. I do also love the use of hand tools. So I signed up for the online course and will hopefully get started on my first from scratch build. I've included some pictures of my Stumac build. Joe. Okay, Joe. Um, let's take a look at these pictures, by the way. Oh, wow, that looks really nice. I love the inlays, the fretboard inlays there. So I'll, I'll throw a picture of this up there. And um, that's great. It's always great to hear from new members. I'm sorry, I'm still looking at these pictures. And he's got a volute on the back. That's always nice to see. Okay. All right, so yeah, I think you'll really get a lot of, out of the from scratch style of building coming from the kit building world. Like I always say, building from a kit uh, kind of forces you, it pigeonholes you into building in certain ways that aren't correct is really the only way, way to put it. And so when you learn how to build from scratch, you actually end up unlearning some of the things you had to learn from kit building. There's definitely a lot of things in kit building that you take and you carry over, particularly your fret work and things like that, you carry over into a from scratch build, but there are definitely some things that you'll find, oh, this, you'll, you'll do it this from scratch way, this more integrated building style, and you'll, um, I think there'll be that light bulb moment where you realize like, oh, this is better. Like this, this produces a better result in the end, uh, building in this fashion. So anyway, that's just a little sidebar about the difference between kit building and um, uh, from scratch building. 
Because, you know, a lot of people assume that from scratch building is essentially you build a kit, like you build the individual components, the parts, and then you assemble it all together like you would a kit. But actually, it's, a, it's an integrated style of building where you are uh, integrating the various parts of the guitar into the assembly before they are fully shaped, right? So I just want to point that out. Let's go to another question here. Brian Bullard writes, has anyone built their own thickness drum sander and purchased the drum from Rockler? And then he has a link here uh, for the drum. So you can purchase the drum separately from Rockler if you're building a drum sander. And he asks, uh, if you use this drum sander, how did it work out for you? And did you think it was worth it? So I didn't. So I don't have an answer for this. I guess I'm just kind of kicking it out to the rest of the world. Um, I can say, though, that making the the drum portion, I don't know how much they're charging. Well, actually, I could click on here and find out. For the the drum, oh, the sanding drum's 200 bucks. That's kind of pricey. I mean, it looks like it's, it's made out of solid metal, which is very nice. But it's not terribly hard to make the drum itself by cutting a bunch of, in in my case, five inch diameter discs and uh, affixing them all to a, a central axle. But um, if you if you check out the Pat Hawley drum sander, there's plans for that from woodgears.ca, which is Matthias Wendell's website. Uh, he made fantastic plans for this drum sander. You can get an idea of how to how to build that. That's all I can say about that. I don't have experience with buying that drum, although it looks, if you have the 200 bucks, it, it actually looks like a really solid drum and you're definitely still saving a lot of money on purchasing a whole drum sander. Although by the time you purchase that drum and then a, a motor and, uh, and the wood to put everything to the stand and everything else in the table together, uh, you might be in a thousand bucks at that point anyway. I don't know. Let's see. Eh, probably not a thousand bucks. That's you'd, you'd still save a little bit. Okay, gluing in the label. This is from Frank Lewis. Frank writes, hey everybody, what is the best type of glue to use to glue your label inside the sound box? And he has a picture here of his label too, which looks really sharp, honestly. That is a really gorgeous label there. I'm gonna definitely share that. The rosette looks awesome too. Both of those things work well together. So I just use Type Bond. There's, I don't think there's a perfect right answer here because I don't think this is a very, uh, as far as the adhesive that you choose, this is a very critical choice to make. You could probably just use Elmer's white glue, honestly. Um, but I just use Type Bond. Uh, I guess to name some glues I wouldn't use, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use cyanoacrylate glue. It's too messy and it's going to stain the paper itself. Uh, wood glue isn't going to do that as long as the, the paper is thick enough. I like to use like a parchment paper that you can get from an office supply store like Staples. Uh, partially for the look, but also it's it's uh, got some substance to it. You don't want to use a, a very thin paper. So yeah, I would just use Type Bond. That's my uh, take on that. Okay, here's a, a topic titled Setting the Neck Block and Tail Block. Joe Cipolla writes, In the video, you center the heel and neck block to the center line of the mold. What about top to bottom? I also have a template for the sides that I purchased for the OM sides, which allows me to cut the side close to form, which reduces sanding time with the radius, radius dish. You don't mention using these types of templates. Please let me know if the question was clear enough. Thanks, Joe Cipolla. And he's from Long Island, New York. Pretty cool. I think you're at... Oh, so I'm sorry. And then I'm going to read um, Lamar Duffy. Always has great responses in the 
forums. So I'm going to read him here because he got to this question first and wrote a very good and informative response that basically answers it for me. Lamar writes, I think you're asking about, one, where you glue the blocks with regard to the depth of the sides i.e. the depth of the guitar body, and two, about contouring the sides before bending. While awaiting more experienced advice, I'll give you my beginner's two cents. You can indeed reduce dish sanding time if you contour your sides before bending, but you need to be really careful in identifying the soundboard and back edges of the rim and your desired show face on each of the sides. Even when you're trying to be very conscious of this, it is easy to make a mistake, which is an even more major mistake if you're bending a cutaway. In your first bending attempts, it is easy to get a little twist or slant in the sides as you get the sandwich settled into the side bending form. If you've contoured the sides, you're a bit more likely to have this happen. If you haven't contoured the sides, it is easier to keep them straight. You might want to leave the sides straight, non-contoured for your first bending attempt. So I'm going to pause here for a second because that's the main part that I really liked about his answer. Uh, th that is pretty much exactly what I would have said too. That yes, of course, you can, as many people do, contour. Put, uh, when I say contour, I mean put that taper into the back side of your sides before you bend them. A lot of people do that. You see these templates, these tapered templates that they sell so that you can mark that out, cut your sides to shape and then bend them. But for a first bending attempt, attempt especially, this uh, is the kind of thing where its positioning in the mold needs to be taken seriously to an extent that a first time builder simply might not uh, be aware to, to do, right? Might not be aware enough to, to take it seriously. So, it's very, there's some very costly mistakes that can happen there, which essentially just lead to more sanding in the end anyway, which isn't bad just because it takes more time, but also because you're going to actually sand away a significant part of the depth of your guitar and you'll end up with something that's thinner than you planned because you tried to cut those sides to begin with and then sand them after the fact. Don't be, I'm going back to his question, answer. Don't be overly worried about the time you'll spend driving the bus. This is driving the bus. That's when you're <laughs> uh, turning the guitar and mold in the sanding dish. 50 grit sandpaper on the sanding dish makes faster progress than you might think. If you're, if you're comfortable planing or doing some focused sanding on a belt sander, you can work those rims down a bit before radius sanding while doing it all on the dish is a bit slower. It is more mistake proof. That is also very true. In my online course, I show you a way of uh, kind of picking out the high and low spots to remove with a plane or a chisel before you take it to the dish, but it is definitely more of a foolproof safe bet to just sand the whole way down, uh, which is actually usually what I do anyway. People take different approaches with regard to placing the neck and tail box. One is to place the bent rims in mold soundboard side down on a flat table and place the blocks flush to the table. This puts all your rim excess to the back and if you've pre-contoured your rims, this is the approach you have to take. Another approach which you can use if you haven't pre-contoured the rims is to glue the blocks in about midway in the depth of the rims. This will give you excess rim on both the soundboard and back edges of the rims. Um, I'm going to say do the first one, which is to put all of your excess on the back side. Don't uh, center your block in the center. Now, I'm not... Um, he mentioned that these two approaches because I actually, in the online course, teach the approach where we center the block in the middle but i am going to say it's you know it doesn't ruin things if you you've done it that way I've, i did that for many years but i don't do that anymore i just push them all to the what will be the soundboard side and let all of the excess hang out on the back side and i do all my removing on the back side and for um just uh 
reasons of the neck angle and how everything's going to get laid out in the end, it just makes more sense to do it that way. Push your blocks up to one side. Okay. So that's my only correction here, which is actually a correction on myself because the reason he's saying that is because I, I taught it that way to center the blocks, but I'm going to say I don't do that anymore. Okay. And that's basically it uh, for that question. That might be it for all the questions actually. Because I've spent a good time on a couple of these. Uh, let me see if there's, let me just scroll through here first, see if there's a question or two that I still want to grab out of here. Okay, this will be the last question here. Gary Rosquist writes I was bending some tiger maple for the binding for my guitar with a Venetian cutout, and it kept cracking because of the short grain in the wood. I saw a YouTube video from Ken Parker arch toppery on bending figured sides he recommends prior to the bend gluing on a piece of linen to the guitar side or in my case the binding on the convex surface of the bend after it is bent then heating it up slightly with a bending iron the linen is easily removed i tried it on my tiger maple binding and i didn't have any cracks if any of you in the future plan on bending figured wood for side material or for bindings try this it really works it will also help to keep the sides from cupping and then he also writes just to make it clear he glues on the linen with epoxy after a little heating with my bending iron i was able to easily pull off the linen prior to gluing up the binding on the guitar I would recommend you see his YouTube video and here in the forum, if you guys are, have access to the forum, he has the YouTube video listed here. Um, I think that's, that all sounds great to me. I've never heard of this. Uh, it sounds like a great idea. So if you guys are struggling with bending figured wood, use a little epoxy to glue down, uh, he calls it linen. Let me see if he had any more information on that. No, it's just a piece of linen. Okay, I'll have to watch the video. So Ken Parker Arch Toppery. If you guys want to check that out. All right, thank you, Gary. Okay, and that's all I got for you guys today. If you want to post a question yourself, you can write it in the YouTube comments. Sometimes I get to those, but also a more surefire thing is put it in the members forum if you are a member of the online guitar building school. Okay, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.